<laughs> you probably have my favorite background out of any guest ever now. Nice. Yeah, this is my, <laughs> this is my, uh, my home studio room. Hey, how's it going, everybody? Portable Trevor here, and today we have a very special guest. He is the Duke of Metal. He is a fo- he is a guitarist for the band Fozzy. Please welcome Rich Ward. What's going on, Rich? Hey, Trevor. How are you, man? We just uh, spoke for like ten minutes. We pretty much covered everything, so that we're yeah. I guess we're up, done. Right? So you know that that was actually the outro. I'm sorry to tell you that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> How have you been, man? I mean, you and I talk on the phone pretty regularly, so we're gonna have to be creative with what we talk about, so it won't be just the same. Uh, the same conversation that we have well i feel like i still haven't really dug into like you know who you are and like what you've done very much i mean you've told me quite a bit but i kind of want to you know dive into that a little more that's what this show's all about cool. and uh so rich is a just an incredible incredible human like uh he's so kind and we've just developed this friendship over our love of the 80s a decade that i did not live in that we're, we'll definitely get into because Rich probably has way more stories about the 80s than I ever could because I was born in 94. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yours is a rear view mirror uh, view of the 80s, which is still cool because it's like for me, I didn't grow up in the 60s, but I love the 60s, you know, mm-hmm. and, and I love the 50s as well. There's, I think there's always something cool about a romanticizing an era that you didn't grow up in, but maybe your parents did or you kind of learned through pop culture that kind of lives on. So it's like, it's, you know, however anyone arrives at the 80s, I'm just glad that they arrived at that awesome destination, right? Oh, yeah. And what kind of really kickstarted my interest was this new genre that uh, some of you may be familiar with called Synthwave. Me and Rich have really like bonded over this genre uh, with bands like, you know, The Midnight, FM84, uh, Gunship. Those guys are super awesome and they've inspired a lot of my work over the past few years. But, you know, looking and then looking at their aesthetic and then looking at, you know, movies and pictures of the eighties, it's definitely a romanticized, like exaggerated version of the eighties, but I love it. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. I always talk about it because, um, I, I, uh, recently started what you and I have obviously talked about and you and I are working together creatively on it. Uh, I've, I've got a eighties tribute band called guardians of the jukebox. Um, and that's the conversation that we had when we first put the guardians together was the idea of, do you do the Disney Epcot version of the eighties, which like, you know, when you're walking through Epcot, look, there's France. It's not, (laughs) it's kind of like the Americanized, like super Hollywood version of what Paris looks like. But we've decided with, uh, with the guardians that we weren't going to be like, ha 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 with it. In other words, we didn't want it to be a cutesy version of it. We wanted to play as if we were magically, uh, well, because all of us in the band grew up in the 80s, so uh, we can't, you know, we can't, we can't relive it, but, but you can kind of teleport, you know, back to that era and remember who you were, what clothes you wore. When you saw Journey Live, they didn't dress like cartoon versions of the 80s. They just dressed like they're from the 80s, like the same way in the 70s. You know, when people go to costume parties and they dress up like the 70s, everything's like super over exaggerated like the bell bottoms are so big you can't walk in them but but it's like the goof the goofy hollywood version but i think what we've just tried to do is just um for people who love the 80s is really try to represent it as genuinely and as authentically as possible and uh i do love that about the midnight that it is like you said it is this it is a romantic vision of of the 80s it's a little overdone but it's not it's not in a jokey way. It's actually done in a romantic way that you can tell whoever the two guys who are the main guys, the you could tell they're just in love with the aesthetic of the 80s. They're in love with all the clothing and the, the art and just everything about it. Uh, and they capture it beautifully. And I think that was uh, I think you and I talked at a Southern Honor Wrestling event. And that was our first kind of you like the midnight, too. I thought that was our secret. Yeah. So. <laughs> It's really yeah, cool. I suggest to anybody to, to go check them out. They're so cool. Oh, yeah. Because you were like probably the first person I ever met. I was like, oh, it's this small band. You probably never heard of them, The Midnight. And then you're like, eyes popped. And you were like, I love The Midnight. And I just like had to turn to my friend Nathan. And I was just like, do you hear this? This guy knows who The Midnight is. And I didn't have to show him. <laughs> <laughs> it was so cool. We, um, 
the Midnight was playing the night after Fozzie uh, did in El Paso, Texas. And we had another show the next night, but I was trying to convince our manager and, and Jericho into canceling the Fozzie show just so that I could stay behind in El Paso and watch the midnight play live. That's what a big <laughs> fan I am. This may be my only chance. Cancel the gig. So, uh, and that's the oh, secret man. to, um, that's a secret to filmmaking as, as yourself as a filmmaker. And the secret for me as a musician is, is never lose that, that love and that passion for music. Um, even though that making films is difficult at times and making albums, I mean, I'm in the middle of making a new Fozzie record and we're a year and a half into the process. Um, and, uh, not, not that we work every day on it, but, um, every, every I'm sure for you, every film is, every film project's different because you're working with different people and there's different timelines. And uh, long story short is that it's not always the most, um, rewarding uh, process now the result is the part the payoff sometimes Absolutely. the process can be really hard and and it can it can be soul depleting and you're you, you can spend quite a bit of time with your your face in your hands just shaking just saying you know what are we doing here like but uh i think part of the reason why people who stay in the business for a long time and are successful is because ultimately there's there, there's a true um um, you know, at, at, at its core, there's this joy uh, for what you do that, um, you know, it's, it's not, there will always be a profit motive because profit motive um, keeps guys like you and I from having to get a job. Like it, it'd be great to be able to just work in the industries that we love. Right. Mm -hmm. But if we, if we didn't, we'd still, I'd go get a job working at AMC theaters as a ticket tearer. And, and then still do music when I got off work because I love music. I would never quit it. I'm just hap I'm happy and fortunate like you that we're able to work in the same career that we're passionate about, which is pretty badass. Yeah, I love it. And earlier this year, I did a film, and I feel like you can probably relate to this. Um, we we started at like eight o'clock, and we didn't finish until like six a.m. But it wasn't one of those like I want to kill myself, like kind of you know staying up late. It was kind of one of those like. I'm tired, but I feel like a kid in the candy store. Like, I yeah. feel like I'm getting away with murder. Like, you know, remember when you were a kid and you'd stay up past late, like at the sleepover and like play video games or something like that with your friend. Like I, those are the kind of feelings that I love when I'm making art is, you know, I could stay up, you know, for 24 hours straight and make a film and leave the set being like, wow, that was a great time. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And sometimes those are the best stories because uh, <clears throat> when things are easy and they go just as planned, like uh, in, in two years, those aren't the stories that you laugh with your friends about. You know, it's always the ones where the cops show up because you didn't pull a permit for the shoot. <laughs> you know what I mean? And you're like we did on the painless video. Yeah, Nathan uh, told me all about that. I, I'd love to, um, to derail a little bit. Can you please tell that story? Because it's so funny. Yeah, well, uh, a really good friend of mine, Kerry Champion, he's a guitar player. Uh, he rents or he used to rent a big warehouse facility uh, at a, in a warehouse complex in the city that I live in, in Canton. And we, it was a great place. We scouted it. It's, it was a rundown old mill. It was, it had all the kind of character and grittiness. It was perfect for the video. So Nathan and I had scouted it. We'd taken photographs, did a little kind of just uh, some quick shots to make sure that we, um, we kind of mapped out where we we're going to do each shot. Um, and we were, weren't there for 10 minutes before the landlord called the cops and said, uh, hey, what's going on? I t asked my friend, hey, I thought you got permission. He was like, well, I figured because I rent here that, you know, we'd be OK. <laughs> and oh, luckily for luckily for us in Fozzy, um, one of the great things about having a really famous front man in Chris Jericho is that uh, most people kind of know who he is. So these police officers that show up are like, is that Chris Jericho, the wrestler? I'm like, <laughs> yes, it is, sir. Yes, it is. And that that he and he actually said, man, just can you what hurry up? Like a lot of times if you're nice to people um, and you, you go out of your way to show them that, hey, I respect you. I know you're just doing your job. We're just trying to do ours. I'm sorry we didn't pay the city 1500 bucks to pull a permit. And then we didn't spend a thousand bucks on insurance. I mean, we 
those are the things that you should do. But sometimes, as you know, guerrilla filmmaking is the funnest. Like it's just absolutely everything's in the back of your car. Everybody gets out. It's like let's go, go, go. And those are the those are the fun parts. The problem is, is that if you're rolling the dice on whether the cops are going to show up, <laughs> <laughs> and those are, I mean, I've been in so many bus wrecks. Um, I've been in fist fights with band members, um, being detained by, uh, you know, border agents going from Italy to Austria, like all of these crazy things that we've been through in our lives, uh, are, they're my favorite stories. You know, we get together as a band, you know, and, and Frank and I, our, our drummer who's in Fozzy, he and I were, were playing together in Stuck Mojo in 1991. Like, and we were friends and started becoming, we became friends in 1988. We have this, this long friendship and we've, you know, as, and I know why filmmakers and musicians stay with a group that they're familiar with, because first of all, chemistry is everything in our business. Like knowing that you're putting together a team where you can trust each other and that you know that the team is better than its individual parts that like a baseball team, you know, you, you can't have five pitchers, you know, it's like, okay, everyone plays their position and a, and a great team is when everyone, you know, covers their own position perfectly and you work so harmoniously and you've just got this great chemistry. And so uh, that's one of my favorite parts is uh, going out on tour after being off, especially after this COVID thing. Uh, we had a, f a few shows uh, last weekend. It was just great to be back with the guys again. You know, and just sitting down and laughing old stories. Um, and there's something magic about that. And I, I think that's something that someone who hasn't ever been in a group creative environment, uh, it's something magic that I, I wish everyone could experience. Just that joy. Because what you and I do is you start with nothing. There's no film. There's no music. It's just you start with the concept and you start building and you have a, have an idea and then you start building and you're bouncing ideas back and forth. And, um, and when you're all said and done, there's something that you've created that never goes away. Assuming that the, the, the little zeros and ones <laughs> that are the little, you know, the little data bits that, you know, the, you know, which it becomes our product is assuming that it never gets lost in the ether. I mean, uh, it's a shame that, you know, people who had student film projects in the 50s and 60s, I'm sure a lot of those, you know, the actual film didn't, you know, didn't last the test of time because they didn't, weren't able to convert it over to digital. But what well, in the Quick digital age, everyone, thing, please convert your VHS tapes. They will go bad. <laughs> that's true. I, I have a huge box of them. I, I need to convert mine. I have like the massive tape trading from the old wrestling days and mm -hmm. live bootleg concerts. Of course, everything's on YouTube now anyway. So, yeah. <laughs> Don't need them anymore. But anyway, that's continue. right. I was just saying, I, you know, I think that's my favorite part of this is starting with nothing, but just this abstract concept. And then when you're done, uh, you know, when you're queen, you end up with Bohemian Rhapsody or, you know, if you're ACDC, you know, you, you have an ID and six months later you have back in black, one of the greatest rock records of all time. And it will last forever. And it, it's, a, it, it changed our culture. And, uh, and those are that what, what, you know, I mean, what you and I do are, are pimples on their butts, but it's great to at least be in that, in, in that, in a world where we can still do, uh, projects like that, where we, again, we, we create things that, uh, out of nothing. And then all of a sudden we have, you know, I, I hate to say is that art, but it's, you know, you know, uh, entertainment, things that make people laugh or, uh, or cry or whatever, you know, we get to, uh, you know, we get to kind of get emotional responses from people based on things that we created out of nothing, which is cool, man. Yeah. There's something comforting about, you know, hearing, you know, ACDC queen, they all started with a blank sheet of paper in front of them. Yeah. That's and right. like, the same, like the me same and you, every, that, yeah. yeah, every time right, we right. start things, we start with nothing and everybody's experienced that. You know, there's been times I've literally have stared at this computer right here in front of me and just, you know, made this face for like two hours straight before I typed anything. Like we've all been yeah. through that. Yeah, you're so right. I mean, think about it. Like 
Halloween was a concept before it was a, a treatment, before mm -hmm. it was a script, before I mean, like, think about it. I, I mean, can you imagine just like being on set to see those movies that a movie like Die Hard that, you know, will be on TV five times a day <laughs> all over the world for the rest of eternity? It's 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 really cool. And and I think part of um, it used to be when I made records um I made records kind of without a sense of of reverence for the art. I was making them out of kind of either just kind of um, uh, the goal to make the best thing that I could possibly make with my band and that we were going to take on the world. And now I, I see things differently because now I realize that um, life is, is finite and, and the music business and uh, the film business things change so fast. I've got friends of mine who are incredible musicians who are now working regular jobs because things just happened in the music industry and their band fell apart and they're never quite able to kind of get there again. So everything I do, I kind of take it as if, is this the last tour? Is this the last album? Like there's a sense of reverence with it because I know nothing lasts forever. I mean, no, no professional wrestler or no professional football player ever thinks it's going to be the last game or the last match like mm -hmm. everyone just thinks it's going to last forever and I think being able to have that perspective also helps you appreciate it a little more because um th you realize that uh you know one day you'll you'll wake up and they'll all just be kind of reminiscing you know of of those times the same way that you know our our parents reminisce about things that they did when they were younger not to say that you can't ever do it again. There's musicians who are able and filmmakers who have had hiatuses and have been able to come back, but it's harder once you've gotten off, you know, and you've kind of assimilated back into uh, a, a, a job and a routine and, uh, because what you and I do requires, like you said, staying up till 6am working on projects. There's no, the, the idea that you keep a schedule is I don't, I don't keep a schedule. I wake up, I do DDP yoga in the morning and then I work and you know what I mean? And then at some point I get tired and I go to bed and like <laughs> it's somewhere in the middle you eat and I spend time with my wife, but you, there's never a clock in clock out. What, what you and I do is based on, uh, and it takes discipline because there'll be times where I, you know, I may play guitar, but I don't do a lot of work work and it takes, you must sit down. You must, you must, you know, get the shovel and start digging, uh, or the, or you, you'll never do anything. And I think discipline's important in this business. Yeah, absolutely. So to go back to the and I feel like this is definitely going to open up a can of worms, but, um, we you were talking about the music industry and how it's kind of shifted a little bit. Um, I was listening, I heard an interview a while back with, uh, Adam Levine, lead singer of Maroon five. And he was talking about, he was like, if you look at old pictures of like, uh, huge musicians back in the day, like Led Zeppelin had their own private jet and Maroon 5 was like, yeah, we don't have that anymore. And it just kind of blew my mind. I was like, that's such a huge band. I figured they'd have everything. Um, how do you think the music industry is going to keep shifting like that? Do you think, you know, artists are just going to keep struggling and struggling until there's almost no point in making money being a musician? I could only speak for myself and I, I try not to pry too much in my other musician friends by asking them about money. If they, if they choose to open up, then obviously I, li I like to listen because I'm interested in the economics of the business. I will say for myself that uh, money has been great. And part of the reason is, is because I'm not in Maroon 5. Like those upper echelon bands have been hurt because they used to make tons of money selling albums. Mm -hmm. I've always been a working class musician. I sell good amount of records. I have songs on the radio, not number ones. They're on the charts and we tour and we tour on a bus, but all we're all in one bus. We don't have a bus for the singer, a bus for the guitar player, a bus for the crew guys. Like, you know, we don't have four semis. We pull our trailer behind the bus. We're a middle class rock and roll band, blue collar we go out and we're we're the majority of what people are in this business who are working. Now there are younger bands that are in vans, 
I was in bands for the first 10 years of my life. And it's important to have that because that's how you grow as a band. You know, mm-hmm. you need to be able to know the scent of all your bandmates <laughs> and, you know, and know their, their good and bad habits. That's how you grow chemistry. You need that close proximity. Um, but uh, so the way that's great for people like myself is that there are 10 million ways to make money now in the music business. Whereas in the old days, there was one way making records and you didn't make a lot of money touring. The touring was a break even proposition, but the touring was to promote the album. So now bands are putting out albums. They're not making any money on the albums, but the albums are basically promotional material for new touring. So it's like, hey, we got a new album out. Come see us when we play The Masquerade or when you're in Atlanta or Harpo's when you're in Detroit. And so the roles are reversed on how income's made. But how artists can really make good money is is YouTube. And uh, people always bitch about Spotify and Apple Music. Well, they pay. That's the thing is it may not be tons. But the, the difference is, is in the old days, a lot of the record companies, uh, I, I, I'm not saying they're all this way, but when one person is in charge of how you get paid and this is before the days of computers and where you can track every album sold because they're scanned you have to take the record company's word on how many albums they pressed how many albums they shipped and how many albums were sold it and then if you didn't believe them if you felt like you had sold more albums well you had to prove them wrong by going and getting a cpa then you have to give them 30 days notice for them to prepare the books. Then you would audit them. But they had 30 days to cook the books if they wanted to, to, to make them look however they wanted to. And yes, um, you know, the burden of proof was on us to prove that they were being dishonest and that we had sold more than they had. So it was really hard for bands to, to prove that they were successful and to make a lot of money. Whereas now, do you think Apple Music's going to cheat artists? They, they wouldn't even dare because there would be a class action suit and they'd be out of business. So Apple Music and Spotify, even though it's fractions of a penny, they do pay you. So every month I'm getting checks from Apple. I'm getting Spotify. I'm getting checks from, from uh, Sound Exchange, which collects my stuff from online usage, which is YouTube videos. Uh, I mean, Judas is at 42 million views. This is intellectual property that I have a stake at. So I, it's not tons of money. It's just that it's small amounts, right? And, and it's just like when you make a film and it goes up on Netflix, uh, like you already spent the time and effort to, to get it there. So this is just mailbox money. That, that thing's making money for you forever. Like, so when, I, like, I don't have to do anything. To, I don't have to water Judas. I don't have to fertilize Judas. Like, it's already done. So it's just out there as an entity making money, uh, which is great. And that's why I, I, I'm, and I'm also lucky that I'm 50 years old and I've made 19 albums because all those albums are all doing the same thing. They're all out there kind of working for me. Some working harder than others because, you know, obviously the more popular and more recent albums are, there's more activity. Um, and I know it's hard because I know what, what I'm saying, it pisses a lot of other musicians off. They're like, well, you know, but still the, it's not a, it's not an artist friendly formula. Well, what are you going to do? Like, this is, this is the world we live in. Like, so you, then you could maybe you could do Patreon. I mean, there are ways where you can connect directly to your audience, but if you ignore SoundCloud, if you ignore, uh, you know, the big streaming services, I don't, I don't want to name some and I'll forget others, but if, if, if you, if you ignore them, uh, you, you're ignoring the the biggest delivery mechanism to have fans hear who you are. So let's say that let's say that Spotify is not generating tons of money for me, but they are putting us on their hard rock playlist, and someone's going to come across us and go, "Hey, this is I really like this song. This is really cool." And Fozzie's in town next time. I'll go see him. So they pay twenty bucks to come see Fozzie, and they buy a twenty five dollar T shirt, and maybe they get a signed picture at the merch desk. Or maybe they VIP so they can watch the special concert that we play during soundcheck. It's all these things. And that's the way everybody is going to just have to learn that 
instead of it being the old way where Maroon 5 used to just get a huge check from Sony or Atlantic or whoever their label was. We're like, hell yeah, we sold 3 million albums, here's the check. It's not that way anymore. It's not, it's not like you go to work at Target and you get a check from Target. It's like now you get a check from 20 different people and they're all paying you and, it, and you hope that it adds up to the same amount as if you worked at Target and maybe it's more and maybe it's less. But I think, I think as, as, as you, we end up with more, uh, you know, we end up with more Amazon Musics and Netflix. I mean, all these companies are going to start getting into music, right? I mean, YouTube's now in the music game. A lot of these people are going to start, uh, and it's just good for us because competition's great, right? When it was just Vince McMahon and WWE, it's not good for wrestlers. But then when you got AEW and you got Impact, you got Ring of Honor, you got New Japan, all of a sudden there's options for guys to negotiate their contracts because there's more people there that they could go work for. So um, if, if Spotify wants to do an exclusive deal with Joe Rogan, because they recognize there's an incredible amount of value in what he does, then they can give him a better deal than they give Maroon 5, because they realize Maroon 5 to Spotify maybe doesn't have the same value So to, to Spotify. So I think that's where artists are going to get into a position where if they're willing to do exclusive deals, they can get better royalty rates, or they can just choose to have it on every platform. And I think it's going to be the same thing for you as a filmmaker. Do you want stuff on Amazon Prime? Do you want stuff on Netflix? Like, do you want to just do a YouTube only release and cut your deal straight straight with YouTube and get a better royalty rate uh, than just a standard monetization? And I think that's where it's it's going to be great for the independent uh, content creator, and that we mm -hmm. can either partner with people exclusively or we can diversify and just let the market do what it's going to do. Ultimately, the only thing that we can do is control the quality of what we're putting out. The industry is the industry. And in 10 years, it'll be different. And maybe, you know, maybe Maroon 5 will be begging for the old days where Spotify was only giving them a fraction of a penny, <laughs> you know, like, and maybe it gets worse or maybe it gets better. Who knows? Who would have, who would have thought 20 years ago that, we'd have computers in our pockets, right? And like, it's incredible. And, and imagine what AI is going to look like for bands and content <laughs> creators. Do you know what I mean? Like people could sit at home with, the, with AI goggles on and be on the front row at a concert. It's, it's going to be, it's going to be amazing. And I, I'm looking forward to it. Right. Cause to look back and just romanticize on the days where, when I used to go see a concert, it was all general admission and we slept overnight on the, on the sidewalk outside the venue the night before. My so dad told be, me about those days. <laughs> it's incredible. Like it wasn't like, Oh, I've got good seats. It's like, you know how you got good seats. You spent the night on the sidewalk the night before <laughs> and you hope that, and everyone sprinted into the venue to get on the barricade in the front. And if you had to pee or get food, <laughs> sorry, you just got a piece of barricade and you stayed there the whole show. It was, <laughs> it was great. But I don't know if I want that, you know, again, I, I want to go get a salty pretzel and go pee now. So, you know, <laughs> during, the, during the ballad song, I don't like. As Bob Dylan once said, the times they are a changing. So like I've, I've given, I don't think I'm in a position to always give advice, but some like, you know, amateur filmmakers have like asked me like, you know, Trevor, how did you get in the industry and everything? And I like, I'm a huge advocate for hard work and like even if it was 1980 where I had to use film cameras, like I still think I would be very passionate about film and I would find a way to make a film. And so for a musician, I feel like it's kind of the same. Like, you know, if you really want to be a musician, you'll find a way to make money and, you know, do what you love. That's right, man. Yeah. <clears throat> it's so funny. I saw a, uh, Rudy Sarzo, who is a really famous bass player, he's been in a bunch of really big bands. So he he kind of got his starting in uh, Quiet Riot and played for Ozzy Osbourne. And uh, uh, on yesterday on Twitter, I noticed that a, a fan had asked him, "Hey, do you have any advice on how to make money as a musician?" He goes, "Well, honestly, when I started, I never even thought about making money. Only thought thing I thought about was like making music. And then, and it was the same thing for me." When I first put together the Stuck Mojo in 1989, I was 20 years old. It was my first original band. I'd played covers before when I was in high school, but Stuck Mojo was my first kind of real band where we wrote our own songs. Um, 
I never thought we'd even get a record deal. No one even was like, that wasn't something we thought about. We always thought about it was like, okay, we got to get as many people to our show as possible. So we made flyers and you put them on telephone poles and hand them out at other concerts because, you know, it was exciting to build an audience. But we're a bunch of 20 year olds from Atlanta, Georgia. And the idea was um, that like record deals were for Led Zeppelin and Ozzy Osbourne. You know, they weren't for kids playing rap rock in, in, you know, in, in Atlanta. And so our focus was on truly like the pure motives. The pure motives were to be the best band in Atlanta. And there was this rivalry with all the other bands where we would try to draw more fans. We try to be a better band. Like that was the great thing. It's just like high school athletics or whether it was wrestling or, or football or soccer, tennis, whatever. It's that competitive nature that we have. Like you're pushing yourself, but you're also wanting to, you know, you wanted to make a better burger than the guy selling, you know, burgers next door, which is great. I love that. And then, then that came that realization of like, wow, we're like, we have a big fan base. People are talking about us. We're starting to play out of town. And then that was when the realization was that maybe, maybe there's a chance for us that this could do something. And I, I would, so I'm echoing what you said. If I ever have advice for people, I wouldn't think about, how I'm going to make money first. I would think about, um, you know, building the fastest race car possible before you think about how you're going to spend the first check you win the race <laughs> with, you know, like literally just think, how can I be the best driver? How can I have the fastest car? How can I do all of those things? Um, and when think because if the money's not there, uh, and that was one of your main concerns, it's easy to lose interest, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, because, if, if, if your expectations are you're going to be Motley Crue and have your own private jet and, you know, if your motivations are to be the popular kid in class who has the prettiest girl and all of those things, if that's why you got into music, then if that stuff doesn't happen quickly, then you're likely to just go and get a job working at the Apple store, uh, you know, and give up your dreams of being famous because there's a difference between having a dream of being famous than there is of like being a musician or a filmmaker because the, 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 you could be successful as a filmmaker and a musician without having Grammys or a huge paycheck to, to show for it because you set your own expectations of what being successful is, right? Like if just making the project for you is successful, if just recording an album for you is successful, then having it sell anything, it doesn't matter. Like the goal was to make something special. And then if it, you can monetize it, then that's the bonus, right? Mm -hmm. Like uh, build the cake first, figure out the rest later. I'm full of analogies tonight. Sorry. I'll stop <laughs> no, race cars, cakes. Uh, <laughs> I think a good, another good example of that is something that happened to me recently. Um, I made a, a Tony Hawk pro skater sketch and Tony Hawk himself shared it. And uh, I was like, yes, this is the best day ever. But people, the questions people are asking me like, dude, how much money do you make from that? And I was like, nothing. Like my life is no different from the day <laughs> that I posted that. And people just thought that just because I was famous for a day, like it equaled like success and money and everything. I was like, no, I just made a fun video. And the joy from that was Tony Hawk sharing it. So that's what made it a good day. Not that I even made a penny from it. Amen, man. Some of my favorite gigs were gigs we lost money at, you know, just because <laughs> they're like, they were just special. They meant something, but they're all part of your story. Right. And mm -hmm. you making that video, not only did you learn things by making the video, but by putting it out, you, you learned lots of lessons on like, Oh, wow. Like I, I've seen, you know, people's reactions to it. It's getting my name out there. And name recognition means a lot in today's world. I mean, being able to say that Tony Hawk shared your video, it's it's a uh, it has value. It, it may not be uh, it may not be value you can pay your rent with right now, but it does have value. You know, like it's like when people say, "Hey, you got a blue check mark on your whatever Twitter, or, you know, Facebook account." It's like, yeah, they don't pay you for having that, but there's something about that acknowledgement that like they've acknowledged you as a, as a somewhat of a creator or a, some, a, a person of interest that they've designated you as that person. Uh, 
And uh, being verified has its own benefits in the business because as a content creator, people look at those things. It has intrinsic value. Again, you know, you can't go to your, you know, your landlord and say, hey, here's my blue check mark I'm paying <laughs> my electric bill with today. But uh, all of these things add up and we never know which, pro which project in which demo and which little short film is going to be the thing that will turn into something that you can make lots of money off of. You never know. But again, if your expectations are that the next one's going to be the big one, it's, that's, that's when things get dicey because if it's not, then you have to question, you know, what are your motives? Yeah, absolutely. And I feel like most things that blow up or get famous or whatever, were not things that, you know, in the writing room, wherever, where people go and like, all right, how do we get, you know, Judas to 40 million views on YouTube? Like you yeah. guys probably weren't thinking that when you were writing it, were you? No, I mean, the idea that it would even get 5 million was crazy. I mean, it, it was getting like a half a million views a week at one point. It was, uh, it was like when it first started to snowball, it was incredible. And it's a great video. It, it, it's, it's one of those things that we didn't know it at the time. It was, you know, the concept was mine. Uh, because I saw there was a band called Sick of It All who did that concept that was basically first was Guns N' Roses Garden of Eden. So it started Garden of Eden, then it was Sick of It All. And I was like, I love this concept of just the, the hard camera. And then chaos ensues. I love that. Uh, and then Nathan and I and Jericho brainstormed on what can make ours different from these other bands. What can our be? Of course, Nathan had to have himself on fire. Um, his idea with the clowns, that was his idea. Like, so we started thinking in terms of, you know, what are, what are the interesting, you know, details that we can do? And it's a one shot thing. There's no edits. It's just, Hey, can we grab one magical take? And, and honestly, I think one of the best things about that video, which is the thing that you can never count on is that Jericho is brilliant. Like he was, it was one of the best things he's ever done. He was just, he looked incredible. I mean, he was, you know, to me, like there was something about his image and the way he, he was able to manipulate his body with the, with the uh, half speed film, like just the way that everything looked and his actions, it was, it was incredible. And we just, you know, we, the rest of the band were, were like the girls in the back and the clowns. We were just part of the, part of the chaos. But it was really, uh, you know, it was a great concept and a great performance. And I think the same thing is like for you, like finding the right vehicle and the right performance from one actor or actress. That's just, and then that's it, right? Like, but you never know which one that's going to be. We thought Painless was going to be the same as Judas. Like, we got a great formula. This is going to blow up. And it, you know, is way far behind. I, think, I don't even know where Painless is. It's like 7 million or something. So a fraction, but it could be five million. I don't know what it is, uh, but you can look it up and tell me I'm wrong. Uh, but nonetheless, yeah. But nonetheless, it's. Uh, I think it's a great video, but it's not as it's not as good a video. Eight as million good. views. Eight million. Okay, cool. So it's yeah, like everything, everything Fozzie's done is in the millions. Yeah. And uh, the most recent music video is one that I helped out with. Nowhere to run. And yeah, that was a really a cool concept. <laughs> it was just a PA work. Um, yeah. But, um, but that, yeah, I thought that I thought it was for me, I thought it was our, one of our best concepts and it was just like, but you just never know what the end result's going to be like. Right. And right mm -hmm. now it's probably the least viewed video from the newest batch of videos we've done. Of course it's the, it's the most recent video. So it's got plenty of time to catch up, but you never know what's going to react to people. And that's the same thing with making albums. That's why it's very, it's very dangerous for a band to try to chase trends because um, if you chase trends, so when Stuck Mojo first came out in 95, Rap Rock, well, I should, we put our first album out in 95. Rap Rock wasn't a thing. So, uh, it, it, as, a, as a scene, as in a movement. It was at its infancy. We were one of the first bands that was kind of part of that movement. By the late 90s, rap rock was booming. It was like everybody, like every guy who was in a glam band in the late 80s, early 90s, all of a sudden had dreads 
and was you know was super hip into the idea of doing uh limp biscuit lincoln park uh papa roach all of these bands were all and you guys it. inspired those people yeah i mean the, all those guys were big fans i knew all of them which was which is like uh was really cool because it was great to be in the infancy of a movement um the problem is if you're one of those bands that jumped on the rap rap rock uh bandwagon towards the end of the tail of it you had a very short-lived career. The problem is no one knows when the wave's going to crash against the shore. Everyone's just jumping on, and that's the only problem. It's the same thing that happened in the hair metal uh, movement in the late 80s. There are a lot of bands that really benefited from that wave in 1987 and 1988. You know, and even 1989 and 90 were strong, but by the time 91 and 92 hit, it was over. And there were still some scragglers But once Nirvana and Soundgarden, you know, were out, it was over. And there are a lot of bands that caught that wave at the very end of it. And you just don't know. So it's always better to just be you, like determine what kind of artist am I? Who, what do I, when I'm at my best, what is the music or the art that I produce? Not who is my best version of Lionel Richie or who's my best version of Guns N' Roses. You'll never be as good as Lionel Richie or Guns N' Roses. You're not going to. That's the reason they're the best version of that is that's who they are. You can't pretend to be Axl Rose or try to be a, a, a nickel, you know, uh, knockoff. It's, it's never going to work. So the idea is, is you have to determine who you are, where you are at your strengths. I'll never play guitar as fast as Yngwie Malmsteen or Eddie Van Halen, like, but I could groove my ass off and I've got great tone and I understand some mechanics and fundamentals that are a lot better than 99% of guitar players out there. So I just don't try to shred like Yngwie Malmsteen because ne- that's just not where I excel. I, I work on pitching to my strike zone. Like if I want to, another analogy, if I want to strike out batters, throw my best pitches. Why try to throw somebody else's pitches? And and I think that's the reason why ACDC Motorhead, um, uh, ZZ Top, bands like that, the people like they never changed. They didn't have to. Like they were, they were, uh, they were institutions. They had such a unique style and a unique sound that it could never be replicated by anybody else. You could try to do your approximation of it, but it was so unique, and that's that's where greatness comes from. When Rage Against the Machine comes on the radio, you never go. Who's that again? Like immediately, that guitar sound and that guy's voice, it's such a signature sound. Same with Van Halen. Like David Lee Roth and Eddie Van Halen, that sound is so signature. And so when people, that's why when you see a J.J. Abrams movie, there's like shit tons of lens flares all over it. Like he has a style. You can see, you know, you watch his movies and he, like his movies have a look about it. And he tells stories in a certain way. And I think, like he he can't be Scorsese, he, he you know he, it's like he can't be Eli Roth. He's not those guys, and I think that's the biggest mistake that young people make is that they idolize people, and then they try to be kind of like a version of them. But you'll you'll never be successful, at least at a top level. You'll always just kind of be on those smaller waves that come after the big one, you know. And you can still reach the beach, it's just not going to be any fun, and it's not going to be dramatic. So. I always tell people when they say, you know, what do you do? It's like, you just have to tell me your story. Like, what is your story? Like, and then after you tell me the story, how, how can you convey that to other people? Because you're not just selling a song, you know, because a song on the radio, once it's off the radio, people don't remember the name of your band anymore. You know, I get knocked down, but I get up again. Like that song was on the radio for like five years. You hear it at the Atlanta Braves baseball you know, when you go see Braves or or where the Falcons or whatever, when you're in town, I don't know the name of the band because no one was ever a fan of the band. They were just a fan of the song. So if you want to build now, Kiss never had a single that was ever that popular. You'll never hear a Kiss song that was like that big on the radio, number one on the Billboard charts that for that long. But Kiss built a relationship with their audience and people were a fan of the band, not of just like Detroit Rock City or or one of their big songs or rock and roll all night. They built a fan base 
And I think that's going to be the biggest thing moving forward for people like us is that um, I think that the idea of becoming a Scorsese these days is probably uh, something that's less obtainable. But if you do something super original and you're honest and you know how to communicate with your audience and you know how to build a rapport with your audience, you could actually have your own freaking community that's booming and super active and you can make content for the rest of your life and make a great living. Um, but if you're just a knock eye, knock off Eli Roth making shitty hostile ripoffs, it's never going to happen for you. Yeah. Your stuff's going to go direct to sci-fi and, and you'll never have a career out of it. That's all I ever ask of any artist is that you just be honest. Yeah. Like that's what really takes you off. Like there are people that I see on the internet that I just go, that guy has no talent, but then I look at his lyrics or I look at his audience and I'm like, people love him or her because they're being honest. It's like right. people relate to their words and they, they like feel a connection with that. And I think that's, that's something right. that's irrepla irreplaceable. 100% beautifully said like Tom Petty is, is not, gonna make little richard nervous even though uh both of them have passed on like for vocal prowess like little richard had a four octave range and was just this incredible vocalist whereas tom petty was a storyteller and he had a great voice it was super unique but it wasn't technically brilliant it was the right vehicle for him as an artist because he could tell and convey his stories through this compelling sounding voice as unique and as um again he, he, freddie mercury tom petty was not but uh not everyone is going to be freddie mercury you have to find out what your voice and how are you going to use that voice to communicate who you are to an audience and that that's something that's hard to do it's like it could be the hardest thing in music right is to be kurt cobain like could be the hardest thing in the world is to be this believable guy who's not faking it. He's the real deal. This is Kurt Cobain. He's he like, when he puts on a dress on and plays on it, you know, uh, live on MTV, it's not because he wants to get a laugh. It's because he's laughing at himself. Like this is the real him. Like he thinks this is hilarious. He's not doing it to get attention. Like for him, the joke is on him and he loves it. And I, I think, I think social media has made all of us, um, turned us all into little mini narcissists and it's hard it's hard to not give a shit anymore because twitter tells you you must care what everyone thinks right like that's the whole world of social media is is that you're desperate for people to approve of the things that you say but true artists could not care less like the ones who put out their records and they don't read the reviews because they don't care what anybody else says uh, you know, self-esteem isn't based on a, a great review on by uh, on a on a web page. They don't care, and I think that's the hardest part in the modern era is to not get caught up in the narcissistic side of being an artist and just deciding that uh, you know. And I, I think that's something. I, I it's hard. It's hard, but I think the more that you do it, the easier it is because the more people tell you, like. I can't imagine what it's like to be Chris Jericho. Like I can't like, like you know what I mean? Like I've, I've known him since 98. I love him. I've, we, we've, you know, we ride and die together and have for many years and we've, you know, we've, we share a friendship and family and, uh, and a, and a business together. But I don't know how, when I read things online, just the coarseness that people saying the things that they do, like, um, and, he puts himself out on social media more than I do because like, first of all, I have a much smaller audience and I don't have that kind of personality. Second of all, it's just not my, you know, it's not my natural inclination to, uh, to just communicate in mass like that. I mean, I, I'm a little more self-conscious in that. I'm just nervous that like, is this stupid? Should I say this? Like, like I'm, I'm, I'm almost, almost probably too self-critical. Whereas guys like Chris, who's just so comfortable in his own shoes, he knows who he is. Like, yeah, like he's just a free man. Right. But like, 
I, I couldn't sleep at night if I was him having thousands of people saying the most vile things. They don't even know him. Like, you know what I mean? It's, it's, and it's hard. And it's, and I think that's the longer that you have people tell you that you're stupid, that what you make, the art you make is crap, uh, that, uh, you look dumb in that outfit. Like, uh, you know, you, you should hang it up. You're over the hill. Like I've had people, you know, I mean, obviously at a, as a 50 year old musician, it's a young person's game, but it's the same thing in, in the wrestling world or in acting. I'm sure as, as, especially for actresses, like, um, such a pressure on being youthful, you know, like that's why a lot of women in their forties and fifties are getting plastic surgery. It's not because they're not beautiful. It's that the industry is, there's so much pressure for them to maintain youth. And it's, and social media makes it worse because it used to be with just small pockets of influence, right? Just our industry, directors, producers, um, media moguls. But now every guy who has a smartphone can tell you how much they hate your guts, <laughs> how much your record sucks. <laughs> so you have to have thick skin, man. And, and you just can't take it personal because mm -hmm. half the time they don't, they didn't spend any time on it either. They're just trolling. So you just have to at some point accept that it's like, it doesn't matter. Poltergeist, do you see what's going on over here? Yeah, I saw that flicker. I was like, what happened? Yeah, <laughs> yeah so we, got some, we have some storms going on here. Yeah, we did too over here. Um, but yeah, fame has just always been such a strange thing to me. Richie Good, you froze. Oh, no. We were having such a good comment. Oh, there's Rich. Hey man, yeah, we uh, we got pretty bad storms in the Atlanta area today. So it it uh, even though I'm on my laptop, uh, which I had plenty of charge, it was the uh, wireless internet router that went. Mm. Sorry about that. Oh, you're good. You were really you were also like frozen in a really funny position. You had your yeah. water bottle. No, you had your water bottle. It looked like you were like toasting me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was. <laughs> I figured. I thought I was offline. I figured I'd get a drink while. Uh, while Mother Nature uh, did its deeds. <laughs> no. Oh, yeah, we we're talking about fame, and you know, it's just such a strange thing to me because, like, you know, I do my thing, and I have, you know, it's usually my friends that, like, comment on what I do and everything. And, you know, Chris Jericho, he goes out and does a match and pulls out his phone, and 10,000 people are commenting on it immediately. <laughs> and I'm just like, I, know. I don't know if I can handle that. <laughs> <laughs> You could if you had done it long enough, because at some point uh, you start to recognize that they don't have any investment in the match other than they watched it, which didn't take they didn't burn any calories watching it. So uh, once you kind of recognize now, the people that I do listen to are like longtime fans that you build relationships with. I'm sure Chris has that as a wrestler. I know we do as Fozzie. We have like fans that have been with us since the very beginning and they come to on a tour, they'll come to 10 shows. Like they fall around, follow us on tour, like we're the grateful dead or something, which is really cool to have that kind of relationship with a fan base. And those are the people that you listen to because you trust them because they, they become kind of family and like, you know, they're your friends. Um, and they've been with you for so long, but, uh, you know, it doesn't, I, I still read comments. Uh, like when we put a record out or a video, I'll scroll down and read the comments. But if someone says Rich Ward looks like he's got uh, a mental handicap or something like that, like I just laugh. I think it's hilarious. Like <laughs> I actually think trolling is pretty freaking badass. Like, you know, when it gets mean and it, and it crosses over into, uh, you know, and I know that, you know, you, you, you read stuff where people are like, you know, young teenagers take it really hard you know like like bullying uh but for me i don't ever take it that way i just think i think there especially if there's creativity in it like if someone's like really smart and witty like nathan is like nathan's really funny like his twitter stuff like he'd be a great troll because he's like he has a really he's, funny he's too nice. sense. <laughs> yeah and he is nice but like he could that's why i think he'd make a great troll because he would be somewhat polite about it but he could still kind of do the little passive aggressive nudges, which would be great. Mm. We're, we're talking about uh, Nathan, uh, of course, uh, the director to the stars, uh, AEW and uh, Fozzie video director. So uh, also yeah. my roommate who is probably 15 feet away from me right now in the yeah. house. <laughs> <laughs>
That's that's right. I've been to your house before. You have, and you almost came yeah. here today because Rich didn't know that this was like a webcam show. So no, I was just gonna uh, come over. I was like, hey, what time? Tell me. I was which was really funny. Today. Yeah. I was yeah, I was confused for like two seconds, and I was like, oh no. But I'm so glad you like weren't on your way or something like that. That would have been bad. <laughs> well, I, I I left the studio, and I was just gonna head your way. And I would have been a little bit early. I think I left the studio around 6.30 or something like that. But it worked out perfect. I just went home. And uh, I was in home with time to uh, eat some dinner, and it was good. Yeah. Yeah, so let's talk about that a minute, like studio time as an artist. Like, you know, I feel like that's, you know, the pinnacle of like a musician's career. Like, yes, we're in the studio. We're recording something right now. So you've been like doing that for so many years. What What is that transition like been for you? Because you used to... You said you kind of started from nothing and then you, you know, you've made 19 studio albums now. Yeah. Well, things have changed uh, a lot over the years. I've, I built uh, a small studio in my house so that I can be creative when the urges hit, uh, when I have great ideas, I can, uh, and also I can record at my own pace. Um, sometimes it's good to be on the clock. The problem is, is that a really good studio is somewhere around entry level without staff is usually around $750 a day. And the, the big, really nice studios are kind of closer to two grand a day. So, you know, and most records take a couple of months to, to make. So just do the math. It's very expensive. So I just said, wow, I'm spending tens of thousands of dollars per album in studios. I'm just going to save some of that money and invest it in my own equipment. And I built a really cool spot at my house. It sounds great. And I, I put the money in the key equipment that I needed. Um, I can't record drums here. I don't have that. Uh, this is basically what you call project studio. So we can do bass, guitars, vocals, keyboards. The only thing I can't do here is drums. So we still do the traditional go to the big studio and have the drums in the big room, which is exciting, man. It's fun. I love the big studio. I, I was there today. I, I love it. Um, you know, I, I love that environment. It's, it's also, it's like summer camp for music nerds. Everybody's in there working. And it's the smartest people and you're able to bounce ideas back and forth. And the speakers are the size of like your dining room table on the walls. And you can just turn things up and get vibe. And it's incredible. You know, um, I, I still love, I actually, I, I love touring, but I actually probably gun to my head would say I prefer making records more, uh, because there's something about like, like I do, there have been times where I've literally kind of finished up a rough mix. Uh, I, I don't, we don't mix our own material, but we will do rough mixes so we can share them within the band, get comments, see what everybody's thinking before we send things off to the, to the guy who mixes the record. And uh, there's been times where I've literally openly wept where I just thought we did something good. Like, you know, like sometimes it's, and, and a lot of times it's just because you know what it took to get it there. Uh, and the other part about it that's difficult is that you're doing something in a group environment that's creative, but it's very subjective, right? So then my best friends that I play music with, we have to kind of disagree often on what's the right way because we don't all have the same vision. And that's hard. Like, that's why we started working with a produ an outside producer two albums ago. So Judas was the first time I used to produce all our records, which was, was awesome and it was awful because it was awesome because it was great to be able to control the creative process from the first second to the last second. It was, it was like, it was great to know that everything that went on that record was us. That was us. And I, as the gatekeeper, got to be kind of the coach who made sure that I organized everything because that's basically what a producer is. Uh, a producer is getting the best performances out of all the musicians. He's organizing all the sessions. He's, he's doing the technical side of things as well. So I love that. Problem is, is that if you have a disagreement, sometimes it's whoever who takes the more, more forceful position, who's willing to fight harder, and I don't like doing that because I, that's, that'll put stress on your relationship with your bandmates, sometimes to the point where you, you stop liking each other for a short period of time, because this is personal stuff. 
these are our albums. And I'm basically telling this person, you're wrong. And they're like, really? Oh, I'm wrong? And then they get to say, no, you're wrong. Well, who, what is it, rock, paper, scissors? There's no, there's no like <laughs> refs, right? So, and because I'm the producer, I get to make the last call. So a lot of times it was really straining relationships and it's great to have an outside, you know, producer. Now, Chris and I still kind of as the de facto leaders of the group, we still have a, a, a huge voice in what goes on. It's just that we have someone that is, um, you know, is our Tony Khan, you know, like it's the final word, like, Hey, like I'm, I'm sure Jericho and, uh, you know, and, and Cody can have these decisions and, and discussions and talk. But when it comes down to it, Tony gets to make the final decision. It makes it easy on Chris and I, because then if whoever gets their way, it wasn't because we fought harder to get our way. It's because, Hey, we're paying him to make these decisions. We trust him as our coach. Um, it works great. So, uh, long story short is, so I built this room and, uh, and I get to live in both in, in both worlds in that um, I, I can work when I get up. I can work as late as I want to. I don't have to worry about driving home at 4 a.m. Uh, by the way, they don't put studios in nice neighborhoods because they normally put it where the real estate's cheap. And it's usually in sketchy neighborhoods where there's big, you know, bob wire fences around the building. That's never fun at 4 a.m. or 5 a.m. when you're leaving. So working at home and that way, if you're just, you're like, man, I'm just not getting it done today. You didn't burn $2,000 in the studio and you didn't get anything done. It's like, I, I had a rough day. Okay. We'll come back tomorrow. I didn't play well. I didn't sing well. Tomorrow's a new day. We'll refocus. I'll get a good breakfast tomorrow and we'll do it again. And that's great. You know, I'm sure for you having Final Cut Pro or premiere or whatever you're cutting your videos with having it on your computer in your room and work at it when it's convenient for you it's amazing imagine the old days where filmmakers had to go and edit to edit suites i get to book time you go and it's expensive and hey and when your session was over it didn't matter if you were done hit the bricks you're out i got somebody else's edit suite after you and that's the way the studio used to be You've got the studio. We would block it like 10 or 12 hour blocks. So normally we'd get there at like two in the afternoon and work till 2 a.m. That was kind of the normal thing. Well, a lot of hip hop artists love to work at night. So they'd come in at two o'clock in the morning and they'd work until 8 a.m. So we'd, we had, no matter whether we were finished or not, we had to get out. Like, so yeah, and, and it's stressful. So this has been great. So I can track guitars if, if I want to, you know, if I want to, uh, if I want to grab th this guitar and play this piece here and it's, and I'm, uh, and I'm saying, okay, not working. And I can just switch guitars and switch guitars, change, change amplifiers, keep working and working. And it's great, you know, and I don't have to look at the, keep staring at the clock because the clock, the clock will help keep you on schedule, but it's also the devil because sometimes you just want to let it breathe a little bit and, you know, take your time to refine the idea um, or record it, work on something else and come back to it, watch it with, and listen to it with fresh eyes. Uh, you can't listen with fresh eyes, but it would hurt. <laughs> but <laughs> no, I totally get that. Cause I do that with films because, um, I'll be working on a video for, you know, 24 hours straight and uh, my eyes are just like, please rest. Like I can't take this anymore. And I'm like, okay, I'll come back tomorrow. Maybe something will hit me. And then like the next day inspiration will hit and I'm just like, I think I figured it out. So that's probably the same way with you whenever you're, you find that perfect guitar that works or that perfect effect that you're looking for. It's incredible, right? Like, and, and, and sometimes like Fozzie makes studio albums. Stuck Mojo used to make uh, like um, live representations of, of who we were from the stage. So it was just more capturing and harnessing that energy. Whereas Fozzy, massive vocal harmonies, layers and layers of guitar, lots of sound design elements, ear candy, production work. That takes lots of time because it's like scoring uh, for a film. And that, um, you, you know, when you're scoring symphonies, like you have this m massive group of, of musicians but they all can't play at the same time in the same parts. 
because then everything just gets too busy. So working and finding the right sounds that work with this part um, and and how they marry with this part here, where and it and when you have time, you it, in my opinion, it, you know, when you're making ambitious projects, it's always better to have more time and to be able to let it breathe a little bit, and not rush it out the door. Yeah, absolutely. Because um, there's been so many times where I want to get a project done, and like there's just so many factors that go into making what we do. And it's being, being a creative is just a great thing to be, you know, man, like I love being an artist. Like, um, ever since I moved away from my hometown last year and pursued filmmaking, it's not been an easy ride, but you know, here I am. And you know, you're, you've also gone through trials and tribulations, I'm sure. And, but here you are still a musician. Yeah, I was, um, in 1993, Stuck Mojo was already selling out the masquerade and we were a big regional band. We were touring all up and down the East coast and we were doing really well. Like we were, we were as big as you could possibly get as a, a, a local group. Local bands don't sell out 1500 seat venues. They just don't. And, but it was a real special time in the Atlanta music scene. And we just, we just caught fire. I was still working at Taco Bell during the week. So I had worked at Taco uh, Bell. Yes, yes, <laughs> in in Marietta, and uh, matter of fact, you've probably been to the Taco Bell that I worked at. It was on Roswell Road, right by um, uh, seventy five and one twenty. I have uh, been to the Taco Mill. Bell. <laughs> I worked there, and I um I put Rodney on my name tag because people would sometimes, are you are you the guitar player from Stuck Mojo? No, I am not. My name is Rodney (laughs) because, you know, back then you just wanted to, you wanted to live the illusion. You didn't want people to think, dude, I just saw these guys freaking crushing it. And the guy, the guy works the cash register at Taco Bell. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but like as an artist, you're trying to also sell an image. Like, you know, you're, and at the, and at the same time, you have to pay your rent. You still got to eat. And, and it's, and, uh, and I'm sure, you know, I mean, everybody goes through that. It's it's not like anyone just one day wakes up and is successful. There's, you know, there becomes that magic day where you can finally quit your day job and you, you, you've then arrived. But then, you know, there'll be another day where something happens like COVID or uh, after 9-11 happened. Um, yeah, after September 11th in 2001 happened, like the music industry shut down, touring stopped for it was a rough time. Like a lot of guys and bands were having to get jobs. It was difficult, but you know, and you, you just got to prepare for those times, uh, you know, put a little bit of cash away if you can, or just decide, Hey, I may have to get a job for a couple months until things pick back up. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so Rich, something that I wanted to talk to you about, uh, this is one of the first things that I, that Rich told me whenever I met him. So we were at Southern honor and, um, back in black came on. And Rich immediately looked at me and just went, oh, you know what? This is probably the greatest song ever made. And like, I just have never heard anyone say that. Like it was, I was like, I've heard this song my whole life. And it's just kind of one of those things, you know, you hear at a stadium or something like that. And here's this guy next to me, like, this is the best song of all time. And then I immediately went home and I listened to the whole album. And I was just like, you know, this is so simple and effective. But like at the time it was like revolutionary. Can you tell me why that's like your favorite album and why you think that's the best song of all time? Yeah. I mean, I think um, the thing about ACDC is it is, it's not, it's not like rush um, in that there's complexity that's obvious. The complexities in ACDC are more subtle. Uh, So like real artists know what I'm talking about. So in filmmaking or wrestling, uh, any type of art form, just because it looks easy doesn't mean that it is. Matter of fact, sometimes the things that look super easy is because it is highly difficult and somebody who has a high level of skill was able to make it look so easy. And I think that's the thing about Back in Black is that it's such a perfect album. There are no wasted notes. Um, 
it's not uh it's a band who just lost their lead singer so uh who, their original lead singer bon scott died uh they say it was uh alcohol poisoning it could have been drug overdose i don't i don't think anyone definitively knows there's rumors that he fell asleep and and died of hypothermia in his car uh long story short is he died he was the, the he was a very important if not the most important part of the band because he was the visual front guy uh and i think it was this thing where the band recognized that um they were highly emotionally strained at the, that time, as you can imagine, when they're mourning the loss of their their front man. Um, and I think the challenge of being able to continue on and that desperation, like the idea that like when the best swimmers in, in the world, you'll find out when you don't, when you just kind of cast them in the water and see how long they can swim for, tread water. Like a lot of times, like when you're said, the whole world says, oh, your singer died, you're done. Like you're never coming back from this. Like there are very few people uh, who have such a, you know, a, an iconic front man, an iconic vocalist that is able to come back after something like that happens. And, uh, and I think the challenge of that the, and their highly emotional state, which allowed them to channel special stuff the stuff that that magic comes from right like his music is uh there are technical sides to it but it's this the marriage between wow. the emotional and the technical it's when all of those elements all come together and i think external forces put them in a place where they were the perfect vehicle to make that album and they found brian johnson the perfect working class guy with just this amazing scratchy rock and roll voice. And the other thing about it was uh, the late 70s, early 80s were not financially great times, uh, especially in America. There were, there were some, some real difficult times financially. And ACDC was a working class hero band. You know, they all had, they were all rough guys from the rough part of town, you know, ah, fuck you. You know, like, you know, <laughs> chain, chain smoking guys, not pretty at all, n never like hairspray. And like, they were just rough. They looked like they'd fight you as a band. Like they, you know, like I fight Led Zeppelin if we saw them kind of, you know, like just tough, <laughs> cool guys. And I think, uh, I think that resonated with the time who they were they were like, again it's never one thing like that album on its own is is brilliant but i think they were the perfect vehicle for that and they had the perfect uh producer mutt lang who went on to make some of the biggest albums of all time with brian adams and shania twain and def leppard like he was the greatest producer on the planet working with the greatest rock band on the planet after they had one of the most traumatic things that could ever happen to a band where your singer dies in the middle of writing an album and you find this magic working class guy who comes in has got this amazing voice and this band is on a mission and they go to the bahamas and this is a band that's, you know, living in London where it rains every day. Um, and they go to the Bahamas where it's beautiful and it's, and they just have this environment, puts them in this different environment, working and going to the beach every day before they get into the studio. And I think uh, it was perfect storm. And you have the world's greatest rhythm guitar player and Malcolm Young, rock and roll rhythm guitar player. And you have one of one of the greatest lead guitar players of all time, rock and roll lead guitar players, and Angus, his brother, who because they're brothers, grew up together playing. So the chemistry is the great; it's it's the greatest in the world, um, and it's it's perfect. Like you said, it's stadium anthems. It's in its simplicity. Every time you hear "Back in Black," half the people are doing this, and half the people are air drumming because it's just. Um, you know, it, it's just perfect. And, and it's, it's, again, I, I could, I could, I could break it down and get into the minutia, but I think really what it came down to was, uh, Mutt Lang, this incredible producer who had this great vision on how to make, uh, great albums, 
combining with this band who was ready to make this album <clears throat> and they uh and and they did and i think when you listen to highway to hell the album before back in black you could just tell it was there right it's like another bad analogy when the when the baseball when you get up to the plate and the batter takes a swing it's like you saw the first swing man you, you know if he gets a hold of the ball with that swing it's on and they just were there they were already the chemistry was right um and again i think that trauma you know mixed with fi- the 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 uh you know the challenge of not drowning you know under the pressure of losing their front guy and really rising to the occasion i think it was a perfect storm to make the greatest album of all time and you could say that hotel california or led zeppelin 4 or um i mean there's so many amazing albums uh but for hard rock for for just hard rock and and its album sales back up what i'm saying it's the second best selling album of all time behind thriller michael jackson like and it didn't even have a number one single that's the crazy thing is like you shook me all night long only got to four so i didn't know that yes you're talking about a a fan base that we're talking about earlier where you reach out it's not just the single it's not i get knocked down but i it's like this is a band who connected with an audience because what they did was so special and so unique and everyone embraced them. It's, and, and they, uh, you know, they're again, because they were working class as well for the time, it was great because bands like Queen and Zeppelin almost had kind of a posh vibe about them. You know, they, they seemed like they had expensive cars, like the way they, they walked and dressed just looked like they look like rock stars, you know? And I think, I think the way that, that ACDC looked was like, that's my band. Those are my people. I think like, you know what I mean? I think yeah. that had something to do with it as well. There was something about it that was like, you felt like they were on your team. Like, cause you were never going to look like Freddie Mercury or like, uh, like, or Brian May and his white flowing gown, you know, the, the like, the, but to me, that was equally as special, but I think their work, ACDC's working class appeal was the, the perfect complement to this incredible album. I, 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 they, there was just no mistakes made, you know, like everything about it was just perfect. When you told me about it that night. And so in my car, I have really nice speakers and I was like, you know what? I've never listened to a song like this in my car. So I put it on and just that first, it was like, I heard it for the first time. Like you were talking about those, uh, the complexity and the, the simplicity. Like I was like, it's so simple, but that hits so hard. Like no wonder they play this in stadiums. And that's the other thing. Uh, um, so the, one of the rhythm elements that creates kind of groove in that band the drummer always plays in four, four time. One, two, three, four, two, two, three, four. Most rock and rolls in four. But the guitar players swing in three. One, two, three, da da da, do, da 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 da. So the drummer's playing in four and the guitar players are playing in three. Same thing on Shoot the Thrill. Ba 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 da da. So it's one, two, three, two, three, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. One, two, three. So they're playing this triplet feel over the four, four. And that's what gives it that big swing. And so they're swinging like an old school rock and roll band from the 50s and 60s, like where other bands were playing more kind of standard rock music that was more kind of like bad company of the time, which was a little more straightforward. Like there was rhythm complexities to ACDC that, again, like a great filmmaker, you would never know how difficult it was to get that shot because it seems so easy because it looks incredible. But what ACDC does, it's very hard to see a good ACDC cover band. Usually it's kind of crap (laughs) because they're so specific. It's so hard to capture. I mean, anybody can play the songs, but to play it with that specificity and with that kind of um, nuance, it's very difficult. And uh, that's why there'll never be another ACDC. Like, I, they, they, to me, they're the perfect rock and roll band. And, and again, 
are they better than Metallica? No, because Metallica is a heavy metal band. Like ACDC is a rock and roll band. It's different. You know, like it's just like the Sex Pistols are a punk rock band. You, you can't compare one to the other. Uh, but if, if, if you were to say what's the best rock and roll album of all time and the best rock single, I'd just say it's Back in Black. Like, like I'll just let history tell you that's the truth. Like, you know what I mean? Uh, I bought a Back in Black t-shirt at Walmart on this last run we did up to Sturgis. And I was like, I'm still super fan. I still listen to this day. I st- I, it'll, I, it'll probably be my favorite album until the day I go. It's, it is, it's perfect. That's awesome. And um, to go back to what we were saying, like, uh, you know, with the Midnight, like they're not the most complex band of all time. Like, you know, there's so many things in their music that you've heard, but it's just the way they put everything together. It, like everything just yeah. sounds like a dream. And, you know, yeah. back in black, you know, it's today, it's not groundbreaking if it were to come out, but the fact that they, you know, you know, they did those simple things in the, such a complex way, like the drummer playing in a four, four and the guitarist playing in a three, like that's, that's what's so cool about music. Like, not everything has to be so complicated that you're like, wow, this is deep, man. <laughs> it makes yeah, you sound pretentious. So, right. And the thing is, is that um, I, I like to collect um, stem tracks. There's a, a guy that I met online that, oh, that sounds creepy, uh, <clears throat> uh, that. Uh, I got I, a dealer. <laughs> I got a dealer, dude. Um, but he, uh, he has like, and you can find them on YouTube where you go on, you like, queen vocal only mix where it's just freddie mercury's voice of a certain song well Mm. i love to listen to these things because sometimes you'd be so so surprised at how complex a song is that you just didn't realize what was going on until you do the autopsy and you hear just the guitar just the drums and it's when they all come together you're like oh that's just brilliant i had no idea because we're listening we're listening to songs in a two-dimensional state where it's just it's everything mixed into it's the salad right everything's already pre-mixed but sometimes when you're able to deconstruct it you're looking at the ingredients separately oh i didn't know that (laughs) it's the magic cowbell that's what Mm -hmm. did it for me and uh i think that's the brilliant thing it's the same thing with again i always say I'm, i'm a huge fan of film as well so from your aspect people probably have no idea the subtleties of some of the things that you do using filters or just in in the way that you edit the way you cut things you know cutting on the motion uh you know and you know fades and transitions and just the way you do things people they don't consume things thinking in terms of oh look at that transition no one watches a movie thinking about transitions they're look they're absorbing the the story that you're telling from it all the other stuff you're doing in a creative way to, to enhance the story or to not detract from the story, right? Like you don't want your filmmaking to be distracting from what the whole point of the, of the feature film is or the short film. And I think that could be the same thing in music. What's the melody? What's the lyric? Do I want the drummer going crazy over there? Like all I can hear is the drummer going crazy. Focus is over here. You chill out over there on the drums. <laughs> let's, you know, let's play the right part for the song. And I think that's how all great, art is made the right parts in harmony and, and in, in concert with each other. Oh yeah. Do another, think, uh, do another uh, freeze, okay. freeze spray. Do another freeze frame. <laughs> COVID cough. Just kidding. <laughs> that was it. Um, yeah. I think subtlety is so important in art because there have been things that I put in my films that um, while I'm editing it, I'm like, you know, no one's going to think I'm the greatest editor of all time, but I'm going to put this in there because even if no one will notice, like it'll make them feel what I want them to feel like, cause that's what filmmaking is. You're trying to get an emotion out of people. Yeah. And I feel like that's the same way with music. Like there's probably been hundreds of sounds that you've put into your songs that still no one to this day has even pointed out or anything. Yeah, you're right. It's just woven into the texture of it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> sometimes they're super important. Sometimes they didn't have to be there. But as the as the artist, it's your little Easter egg that you put there because you felt like it did something for the overall vibe of it. Um, and there's and there are no formulas that are right or formulas that are wrong. Right. Because, I mean, there have been so many albums that I thought sounded terrible 
that ended up being signature sounds. You just never know. It's uh, uh, again, there's there's no way to look into the future and know like who would ever thought indie rock would be like this mainstream popular form of music. It's kind of lo-fi, doesn't sound appealing like the mainstream pop productions, these big million dollar records we're used to hearing. And yet it has its appeal and there's a, has a huge fan base. So again, going back to what we said, just uh, find out who you are as an artist, embrace that and feel, find the way that you can channel it best to your potential audience. Or don't share it with anybody and make music for yourself or make films for yourself. Share it with your friends, you know? Everyone should start out that way, though. Make stuff for yourself. Yes. Because that's 100%. what I did. 100%. Yeah, it's like so, in Rocky IV. In Rocky IV. I fight for me. Yeah. That's the worst absolutely. Russian accent ever. <laughs> <laughs> well, Rich, uh, we're about an hour and a half in. I'm sure, I don't want to yeah. keep you all night long, but uh, – I think we'll probably bring this to a close. Uh, but before we go, does anyone have a question for Rich? Uh, we got five people in the in the uh, in the stream right now. Um, <laughs> my friend Brandon, who is a Macho Man Randy Savage cosplayer, probably the best one, told me I was yes. flexing my Polk audio speakers. Uh, probably yes. reference to listening to Back in Black. <laughs> I actually have Bose speakers in my 2015 Ooh. Nissan Altima, and they sound amazing. <laughs> nice, so, very cool. Not. Not the most rock and roll speakers in the world, but you know they they pack a punch. I love them. No, uh, Rich, is great, there anything man. else? Yeah, they're good. Is there anything else you wanted to tell people? Well, just that you and I had you and I are going to start doing some creative projects together. I mean, there's been mm-hmm. obviously we're kind of waiting for the Fozzie record to be over, but I think it'd be kind of cool to announce that you and I are going to start working on some some film and some music and all kinds of stuff down the road. So it'll be uh yeah, the the Trev and the Duke. Yeah, we'll be partying Trev together. And the Duke, I like it. Yeah, it's our new production company. Yeah, um, so I, I, it'll be fun. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, mean Street Podcast. Will Will we see you next Friday in Canton for the return of Southern Honor Wrestling? Of course, man. Those are my peeps. <laughs> yeah, I, I watch AEW Dark just to see the Southern Honor <laughs> locker room uh, on TV or on the YouTube. That's uh, very yeah, true. Man. AEW Dark is basically Southern Honor Two. <laughs> it is. It really is, man. So, yeah, I'm always. I'm. I'm definitely looking forward to it. And also, uh, we've got a an '80s uh, show that uh, um, Guardians of the Jukebox is doing uh, on the uh, 26th of September uh, in Canton at the Canton Mill. So we're gonna do. It's gonna be, I'm looking forward to it. We're gonna. We've got a few new songs that we're putting in the set list. Tainted Love, can't go wrong with that one. We're doing uh, Hurt So Good by uh, John Cougar Mellencamp, classic 80s song. Uh, yeah, so we're, I, I just, uh, there's so many great songs from that from that decade. It's almost hard, oh, impossible to put this set, to, set list together. It's probably oh, my I favorite bet. 80s jams. Yeah, man. I really what want to see you guys going are you coming? Are you coming, uh, are you coming to Southern Honor on Friday? Possibly, I'll be returning from AEW that day, so probably depend on how tired I am because I'm not working Southern Honor, so I'll be there as like you know, just a normal uh, audience person. I can't, I don't know, I can't think of what to call them, but um, but yeah, I think I love Southern Honor. I love what it does. It's the highest quality indie wrestling uh, promo that you can possibly go to. Another Nathan Mowry uh, uh, project. Yeah, just take about, it over. Just about everything I'm involved with has to do with Nathan Mowry. <laughs> yeah. Well, he's a good guy to, uh, you know, he's a good guy to, I mean, even if you just had a racquetball, uh, you know, team, he'd, I'd want him on my squad just Absolutely. for nothing else than a great looking mustache, you know, just freaking sexy legs, you know, just a good <laughs> dude. <laughs> I cannot wait to clip that. And send that part to him. <laughs> sexy legs you know you know the deal oh, all right brother well listen man thanks for your time it's fun we'll talk soon and uh we'll get together do some more creative fun stuff and uh party so congrats on the uh on the pod and uh you and i will uh will will commence over maybe a couple of tacos and talk about the new midnight album absolutely and we can talk after a hit and broadcast but um okay thank you rich for coming and thank you everybody for watching 
Um, I upload all the episodes on my YouTube channel, youtube.com forward slash portable Trevor. Um, they're, they have a nice, nicer sound quality. I added a little bit and I had some like transitions and everything, just make it much more pleasing. I'm going to try to do more audio stuff. I haven't uploaded anything to like Spotify or anything yet. I'm going to do that soon, but thank you everybody for watching and I'll see you in the next episode. Bye.